Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. As you probably already know, back in 2020, the Canadian government banned a number of firearms, which are mostly uh, formerly popular hunting and sporting rifles, and they issued an amnesty order that allowed for their continued possession, but not use in most circumstances, up until May 1st of 2022, which is coming up real fast. So people were asking me, what do I do? Like, what's, what's going to happen? And... I didn't really have a good answer because it looked like the government didn't really have a good answer. That's really been confirmed because they've just now extended the order of providing for an amnesty period. But that's not all they did. So let's have a look at this uh, new order and talk about what's in it and sort of what's going on. And they kind of tell on themselves a little bit here. There's some admissions that are made in this that I think are interesting. So we have here the order amending the order declaring an amnesty period. So this isn't a new amnesty. It's actually editing the previous one, if that makes uh, sense. And the key bit, the one that everyone has sort of been commenting on, the one that is sort of the thing making the headlines, is this bit where they say the amnesty period begins on May 1st, 2020 and ends on October 30th, 2023. So that's an extension of 18 months. So there's a little bit more time. Now, as noted, it says it's an amending order, so amendment. Section 2 of the order declaring an amnesty period 2020 is replaced by the following. So they're, again, editing the first order. So this isn't sort of a new document. It's saying we're correcting the previous one. And there's a whole bunch of things that they actually change in here. And so let's have a look at it. One of the first things that they change here is uh, this and they do this in several places. They initially said that if you held the registration certificate on the day, but now they also indicate if you were issued on or after May 1st, 2020, a registration certificate for the specified firearm that they would have been eligible to hold under Section 13 of the Firearms Act had the firearm remained a restricted firearm. So what this covers is there was a whole bunch of people who were kind of left in the lurch because they had just bought one of the firearms that was covered and they were waiting for the registration certificate to be issued. They'd already been approved for the transfer, but essentially if you bought it just the day before the, uh, the order in council was issued, you weren't necessarily covered under the amnesty order. So this is trying to patch that hole. And if we look at the sort of original order here, we can see that, um, uh, it didn't include that. It doesn't, uh, sort of specify those details. So that's a an important correction to this. Uh, but it also shows us essentially that they made a mistake the first time. And there's some other aspects here of honor before May 1st, 2020 entered into an agreement for the transfer within the meaning of section 21 of the Firearms Act to them of a specified firearm that was on April 30th, 2020, a restricted firearm. So again, this is covering people who are in the process of buying something and were issued a registration certificate uh, for the specified firearm that they would have been eligible to hold. And at any time during the amnesty period is in possession of the specified firearm. And you continue to hold the license. That's a the firearms license. So this also makes it really important that you check your firearms license expiry dates. And you got to realize that right now they are super backed up at the chief firearms officers. So you should be applying substantially in advance for renewal, especially if you happen to have any of these firearms. Uh, because if you lose your license, then you have lost this amnesty protection. All right, there's some other interesting bits here that I sort of wanted to cover here. And some of these are um, real interesting omissions that they made. So this one here is about the Bank of Canada. So it says a person who at any time during the amnesty period is in possession of a specified firearm in the course of their duties as an employee of the Bank of Canada who is responsible for the security of the bank's facilities and who holds a license that was issued. So the reason why is because the Bank of Canada protects their assets, you know, the money um, with guns and the original amnesty order failed to include them. So... Um, and I can kind of, you know, the past two years would have been a great time to rob the Bank of Canada because they would have had all these guns that they just can't legally use for anything. Whoops. So that's uh, a bit of an omission that they made there. 
Of course, I'm just cracking wise here. I'm pretty sure that those guns were ready and willing to be used for defense of the money that entire time, and that they would have relied on the reluctance on the part of the government of Canada to go after the Bank of Canada for using firearms to protect the money. As much as governments can often be a little um, irresponsible with taxpayer dollars, I feel like there is a limit to that. So yeah, um, what this really indicates is just the that this wasn't very well thought through thought out in the first place in the same way that if I buy a new car and it's delivered to me and there's no seats in it that I go hey um somebody screwed up when making this car anyway let's have a look at some of the other provisions here so another one is a person who at any time during the amnesty period is in possession of a specified firearm for the sole purpose of storing it on behalf of an owner referred to in paragraph A or B, if storage by them is a condition of that owner's license. So what this was intended to cover, and this is kind of a niche case, but you get some people who, for instance, are moving. And so let's say I am, you know, moving to another house and I have to leave my house on, you know, one day and three weeks later, I get to move into the new house and I'm going to be staying in a hotel in the meantime. Well, that gun's got to be stored somewhere in that gap period. So typically what would happen is that gun would be, you'd get a friend to store it and that would be amended as a condition is that this is being stored um, at somebody else's house. This comes up in some other circumstances as well. Um, let's say I live with somebody who is prohibited from having firearms. And so that you know, there's no reason to restrict me from going target shooting, but they might not want me storing that gun at my house if that person who is prohibited from having firearms uh, might be able to leave or open my safe while I'm away and get access to it. So they might say, listen, uh, Runkle, you can have a gun and you can go shooting with it, but we want you to store it at somebody else's house. So these kinds of cases come up. Um, Again, this is a bit of a niche case, but it's still something that they should have considered when they when they made the amnesty order in the first place, because this was uh, creating a situation of potential legal liability for people who had done nothing wrong. All they're doing is continuing to store a gun for somebody who, uh, you know, as was approved by the chief firearms officer. Now, there's another one here, and this is a situation where they, they say they're fixing a problem that they're not fixing. So a person who at any time during the amnesty period is for the sole purpose of carrying out a repair or adjustment referred to in subparagraph 2 sub D sub I in temporary possession of a specified firearm referred to in that subparagraph that is owned by a person referred to in paragraph A. All right, so this is going to be complicated because there's a whole lot of um, chained references here. And in fact, if I follow subparagraph 2 sub D sub I, it starts pointing to another couple of subparagraphs. So I'm just going to simplify this. Uh, this is talking about uh, repairs for, uh, we'll have a look at what the repair clause says. So repairs or adjustments as necessary for safety reasons of the specified firearm whose use is permitted under subparagraph A sub 8 or C sub I. So that is um, indigenous or sustenance hunters or those Bank of Canada employees that I mentioned. Now, the reason why this comes up is that you had people saying, listen, okay, the order in council and the amnesty order says that I can continue using this firearm for indigenous hunting or sustenance hunting. But what happens if my gun breaks? Can I go and get it fixed at a gunsmith? And previously there was no provision to allow that. Now there's a provision to allow that that doesn't work. And the reason why I say it doesn't work is because they put in um, clauses that basically make this um, sort of useless. What they say about this is that they want or that they allow it to be taken for maintenance purposes, uh, e.g. sighting or repairing that are used for the permitted purpose of sustenance hunting or exercising a right under section 35 of the Constitution Act. All right, so that's what they were trying to fix. The problem is that this this allows you to take it to somebody who is for the sole purpose of carrying out these things. Well, um, and they have to be as necessary for safety reasons. So a few problems. First, nothing says that you yourself can take the gun off to sight it in. And I think that this probably refer, 
I think that what happened here is that this was drafted by people who've never been hunting and don't understand how this works. And they think that when you sight in your rifle prior to hunting season, that you take it off to a gunsmith and are like, gunsmith, please sight in your rifle. Well, that's not how it works. You know, the gunsmith might mount a scope, but in terms of actually getting it dialed in so it's accurate, that's something you're probably doing yourself at the range. So it's not clear that that's actually covered within this. It also specifies as necessary for safety reasons. Well, let's think about that. Let's say you've got a gun and it, it just fails and you know, you pull the trigger and it's broken internally and that trigger no longer does anything or it's just jammed solid. Well, is it necessary for safety reasons that you fix that? Or is the gun now safer? It's really hard to kill anybody, uh, you know, with a gun that doesn't function at all. So now that's a, an open question and it's an interesting legal question, which means it's insanely expensive. And if you're a person who is sustenance hunting, you're probably not rolling in money to hire people to fight interesting legal questions over this kind of thing. If my gun is shooting uh, three feet to the left, which makes it, you know, I, I need to adjust my scope. Um, is that a safety concern? Am I, you know, going to injure somebody doing that? Or is that just something that would make it useful for hunting if I get that fixed? Um, I don't like, you know, the addition of that unnecessary element of as necessary for safety reasons really makes this clause something that you can't rely on. So once again, um, they say that they're helping out indigenous sustenance hunters here, but I would not rely on this amnesty order if I were an indigenous or sustenance hunter here. Um, there's just too many potential traps that are built in. And even when they say that they're taking the traps out, what they're actually doing is adding more traps at the same time. Uh, we can also see that when we look at the sort of relevant provision here, which this is a purpose for which you can use it. It says, if the specified firearm was a non-restricted firearm previously, you can use it to hunt in the exercise of a right recognized and affirmed by section 35 of the constitution. Those are indigenous hunting rights or to sustain the person or their family until they are able to obtain another firearm for that use. How do you establish that you are unable to obtain another firearm for that use? Uh, this is a, <laughs> it basically means if you're out hunting with any of these firearms, you're going to have a whole legal issue that might have to be sorted out at a trial as to whether or not you were able to obtain another firearm for that use. So there is no safe way to rely on this provision as an indigenous hunter or a sustenance hunter. The problem they say they fixed, still a real big problem. Um, I, I would not rely on this if I were an indigenous hunter. Um, it's terrible. The other thing I will mention here is that a problem that comes up for um, indigenous hunters particularly is that sometimes there's disputes over whether or not a particular hunting activity is within the ambit of the rights enjoyed by that particular hunter. And so a lot of the, in, you know, the Aboriginal hunting law um, is around somebody was hunting something and Fish and Wildlife says they didn't have permission to do it. And ultimately the courts say, yes, they did. So normally, what's at stake there is fines because Fish and Wildlife wants to fine the person for doing it. However, look at this provision. It's if you are in the exercise of a right recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act. What if you're wrong? What if you shoot a moose and it turns out the courts say, listen, you weren't supposed to shoot that moose. Um, now you're not just looking at a, a Fish and Wildlife charge, you know, and facing fines for that and so forth. You're also looking at charges for possession of a prohibited firearm with ammunition, which are way more serious. So the stakes on that go way up. I, I've got real problems with this, um, just in terms of the whole philosophy. I've got another video. I'll probably have to redo a video just for time reasons, just on this issue, but, um, 
when they say that they're sort of looking out for indigenous hunters, they really aren't. And, um, I got a problem with that. All right. So, um, mostly here they're adding sort of some provisions here for, uh, businesses. One of the other elements is that, um, they had a bit of an issue with businesses where they were for people taking the gun to be deactivated. So if you wanted to have your gun effectively destroyed by a gunsmith, um, the gunsmith wasn't necessarily protected under the amnesty order when they take that gun in, in order to perform that work. Um, that's a bit of an oops because that was the entire purpose of this whole amnesty order. That's what they wanted you to do is to take your guns in to get destroyed. Mm, I kind of feel like missing that is a big deal. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the regulatory impact analysis statement because the first thing they note is that it's not part of the order. This is just them kind of explaining it. And so they explain some of the problems. I've already gone through them in some detail, but you can see them identifying them. Um, the Bank of Canada could not use part of its inventory, which it possessed and used prior to the May 1st, 2020 ban to protect its assets, premises, and individuals because some firearms are now prohibited and its personnel are not currently legally permitted to use them. So they would have had AR-15s for protecting the Bank of Canada. Now they are allowed to use those again. Uh, the amnesty order did not permit transportation of previously non-restricted firearms for maintenance purposes, e.g. sighting, repairing, and it still doesn't in most cases, that are used for the permitted purposes of sustenance hunting or exercising a right under Section 35 of the Constitution Act. Let's also talk about this just a little bit, because one of the reasons why they said that it's so important to ban these things is that there is no legitimate hunting use for them except these legitimate hunting purposes. <laughs> it's, you know, these are totally unsuitable for hunting, except that people use them for hunting and need to be able to continue using them for hunting because that would be a major injustice. <laughs> I don't understand sort of the logical process that gets you to those two separate ideas. All right. Um, some individuals legally purchased formerly restricted firearms, but did not become holders of a registration certificate. So people in that limbo category that I mentioned, um, this is, you know, they talk about the storage uh, issue and also provides for the deactivation. Uh, although the amnesty order provides for the deactivation as one of its protected purposes, it did not clearly provide protection for businesses to take possession of the now prohibited firearms after May 1st, 2020, in order to deactivate them. Yeah, again, whoops. The amended amnesty order addresses these issues and seeks to maintain public safety, facilitate compliance with the law, and support the exercise of rights recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982 in order to allow further time for individuals to come into compliance with the law. Come on, guys. This isn't because of us. Like, they're implying that it's because the gun owners are not coming. It's allowing for time for you to figure out what the hell you're doing in terms of a buyback. Um, that's what the problem is. It's not, so the amended amnesty order extends the expiry date to October 30th, 2023. So they say that they address these issues. As I mentioned, um, they do better or worse, uh, at addressing some of the issues. Um, some of them are still real big problems. And, um, as is kind of a theme in Canadian history, um, Quite frankly, I think that um, they, the people who really they missed in terms of trying to fix problems, um, indigenous hunters really continue to get screwed on all of this. Anyway, uh, thank you for watching. I hope that this has provided some explanation of this and some further detail. Um, I may provide some or do some additional commentary on this, just going into some of the issues as we go. But uh, please like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to see more content. I want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Jonathan Wheeler, Canada's National Firearms Association, the CCFR, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sites and Arms Limited and Mark Livier Demour. And at the $20 level, Peter Hilger, Mark Whittington, Jane Baven Luxor, Haywire, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Bruno R., Andrew Elsich, and Aaron Delso. Thank you as well to the $10 supporters who are going to be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge and 
see you next time. Oh, and let me know in the comments below if you've got any further questions on this one, because, um, yeah, I, I just kind of shake my head. They admit that they screwed up a whole lot of things, and then they proceed to continue to screw those things up. So, that's our government. Anyway, see you next time.